socialisme, socialisme and democracy, and democracy uh, 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 should better develop this, uh, this, uh, this concept. Uh, uh, now, what, uh, what we did with Peter Howitt uh, uh, in 1987, uh, when I was first year assistant professor at MIT, and Peter Howitt was visiting uh, uh, you know, from Western Ontario, is to build a growth model based that embodies the notion of creative destruction. So the, the, what we call the, you know, the Schumpeterian growth paradigm uh, we, uh, rests on three main ideas. The first idea is that long-run growth is driven by a cumulative process of innovation, where each innovator builds on the giant shoulders uh, 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 of our predecessors. The second idea is that innovation uh, do not come from heaven, they result from entrepreneurial activity motivated by the prospect of innovation grants to innovate, at least for a while you get grants, until you become obsolete yourself. And the third idea is creative destruction, new innovation displays old technology. And uh, you see right away that at the heart of the growth process, there is a contradiction. On the one hand, you need monopoly grants to motivate an innovation grant to, to motivate innovation. But on the other hand, innovators are tempted to use those grants to prevent future innovation and block new entry because they don't want themselves to be victims of creative destruction. You see, and regulating capitalism is all about managing this contradiction. And if you read our book, whether you talk about secular stagnation, about inequality, about green innovation, about the middle income trap, uh, if this contradiction always goes, comes back and comes back. On the one hand, you need innovation rights to motivate innovation. On the other hand, yesterday's innovators are tempted to use their rights that they got through innovating uh, to prevent subsequent innovation. Schumpeter himself was deeply pessimistic about the future of capitalism because he thought that the first innovator would turn into conglomerates that would. Uh, that would capture the political uh, system and prevent all subsequent innovation. In fact, we are more optimistic, but it's not a, it's not a passive optimism, it's an active optimism. It's what, I, what Gramsci would call an optimism of the will, a fighting optimism. So now what the book does is to use the lens of creative destruction and the growth paradigm that I just outlaid to do three main things. First thing is to revisit some main enigmas in the history of economic growth. The second thing is to question some bad ideas about policy of growth. If some people come with ideas, they may be good, they may not be so good. And uh, we question some, I would call, common wisdom. And the third thing we do in the book is to rethink the future of capitalism. So let me go in turn into the, each of them. So some historical enigma. One enigma is the takeoff. Here it's uh, due to Madison, and Madison was able to reconstitute long, long, long term data sets, and that shows you the worldwide uh, per capita GDP. And you see that not much happened until the early 1800s. Growth really takes off in 1820, first in the uh, uh, United Kingdom, uh, then in France, and then in the US, and uh, later on in China, that you have here. Okay, and the question is why the takeoff is so recent? You see, it means that you know, humankind is old. I mean, you know, uh, uh, the, the humans as we know them now uh, are 10,000 years old, but of course, the, the sapiens is much older, and the Neanderthal is still much older, and, and growth is only 200 years old. So, the question is why is the takeoff so recent, and why did it occur first in Europe and not in China, uh, even though China? Uh, uh, the country of invention, you know, the, the wheel was invented in China, the compass, many, many inventions took place in China since the Middle Age and even before. Why didn't the, we see the takeoff in China? And then, Joel Mokir, and we talk about that in chapter two of the book, Joel Mokir very much leads this, uh, in fact, what his explanation, in fact, is very much mapping to this growth paradigm. First, Mokir uh, uh, says in Europe, by 1820, you had institutions that allow for cumulative innovation. And in particular, the Encyclopedia, the Encyclopedia Britannica, or the French Encyclopedia of Diderot, made it possible to codify knowledge. 
so that we don't grab to reinvent the wheel each time. Uh, 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 we can build on, 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 present, on previous innovators because their knowledge is codified. And uh, that was just you know, late 18th century, early 19th. So by then you had the encyclopedia, let's say 18th century. And the second condition is that you need protection of property rights on innovation, because otherwise you don't guarantee the, the rents. Okay? And uh, that was made possible in England by the glorious revolution, and in France by the French Revolution, followed by Bonaparte, by Napoleon. And uh, 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 if you had, uh, had you maintained, uh, uh, you know, Louis the 16th and uh, in France, uh, you would not have a good protection of property rights because uh, the aristocracy would, would steal all the values from the organization. And so that was very important to us. And the third one is creative destruction. Uh, uh, how can you guarantee that new innovators will not be blocked by previous innovators. And in China, for example, uh, if you had a successful inventor, the emperor would be afraid that that inventor would become too powerful. So they would always, you know, uh, inhibit this uh, inventor. And uh, uh, in Europe, because uh, Mokir explained very well that you have competition among European countries. So if one country persecutes an inventor, the inventor could always flee to a, a neighboring country and develop higher innovation in that country, which would then compete with the home country. And that competition between countries made it possible to protect the infrastructure in Europe. It's very interesting that the explanation for the takeoff is exactly map the uh, uh, this uh, paradigm, this paradigm. So now let me go to the second enigma, which is the secular stagnation. If I look at yearly average yearly PFT growth rate in the US, you see that PFT growth was very high in the US between 95 and 2005 on average yearly, but then growth has gone down. You have a growth decline since the mid 2000s. And uh, that's fine because you have the IP revolution, you have the uh, uh, artificial intelligence revolution. How come, in spite of those revolutions which have enormous growth potential, you see a growth decline in the US. <clears throat> and you see what's very interesting is that it's particularly true, it's up and down in IT producing sector, which is the black curve, and in IT using sector, which is the gray curve. And the explanation that we developed in chapter six of the book is that during uh, the IT revolution allowed new superstar firms to emerge, Walmart, Microsoft, Google, Facebook, uh, uh, Amazon, those guys became very important. When they became important, thanks to the IT revolution, uh, growth went up, and that explains the growth going up. But then what happened is that those firms invaded all the sectors of the US economy, and they uh, stifled innovation by other firms. They discouraged innovation by other firms. And uh, that's why growth went down. And they could do that because there was no uh, uh, competition policy was not adequate. It did not prevent them from invading all the sectors of the economy. And now you saw Biden trying to reform competition policy in the US to adapt it to the digital era. And, uh, 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 but until that is done, uh, those guys could become really powerful and stifle innovation by others. So that has a bit of the secret of syndrome. Yesterday's innovator preventing new innovators. And that's where uh, competition policy has a role to play. But where Peter was totally pessimistic, I am an optimist because I said, well, you, Biden came to power in the US. And thanks to that, you have now a new competition policy that may uh, deal with this problem. OK? Uh, can you hear me well? Yes? OK. <clears throat> the source and dynamics of inequality. So we know that uh, uh, top income inequality has gone up a lot since the 1980s, the work of Piketty, Saez, uh, uh, Atkinson, uh, who used to teach at the LSE, who used to be a professor at the LSE. But- uh, I mean, I'm sorry, yeah. sorry, could you just speak a tiny slow? Because the volume in the room isn't the, uh, as great, and I think some of the students could be struggling to hear it. So if you just slow down the pace. Okay, okay. Thank you so much. Do, do you want me to redo things I've done before? I know, it's fine, it's fine. Okay. So inequality, we know since the 1980s that top income inequality has uh, gone up a lot. 
the work of Piquet at Atkinson. But uh, what's very interesting is that there are many sources of top income inequality. One of it is innovation, because we know that if you innovate, you get innovation rents. Those rents allow you to become rich. For example, Mr. Sky in Sweden became rich because he invented Sky. Uh, uh, Mr. Ikea became rich because he invented Ikea. You see? So that's one way to become rich. Mr. Steve Jobs became rich because he created Apple. So, uh, and here it's, uh, uh, on chapter five uh, of the book, we show that indeed innovation is a source of top income inequality. The, the continuous curve shows that in states of the US where you have more innovation intensity, more patents, more cited patents, you have higher share of income of the top 1%. That's the continuous curve. So innovation is a source of top income inequality because innovators get one. But on the other hand, you can see that uh, the, the dotted curve is uh, uh, the effect of innovation on the uh, global measure of inequality, which is the Gini. Gini is the measure of how far you are from total equality as, for the society as a whole. So it is a very different measure of inequality from the share of income of the top 1% income earners, which is the, the continuous curve. And what's very interesting is that innovation doesn't seem to affect global inequality. So that's an enigma. How come innovation uh, 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 enhances top income inequality, but not uh, uh, global inequality? And the reason is that innovation fosters social mobility. When I put social mobility, is the fact that uh, uh, if I am born to two parents, I have a high probability of making it to top income. When you have more innovation, you have more social mobility. And the reason is to be destruction, because innovation means that new innovators replace old innovators, and that's the source of social mobility. So you see, innovation has very interesting effect on inequality. On the one hand, innovation pushes top income inequality. But on the other hand, because innovation also pushes social mobility, the effect of innovation on global inequality is not there. Not there. So that distinguishes innovation from other sources of top income inequality, like lobbying. Uh, what do I call Carlos Slim in Mexico? He's rich not because he innovated, he's rich because he's at the head of Telecom de Mexico, which is a non regulated private firm. It's a monopoly for telecom. Uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and when you, you do lobby and, uh, and you put entry barriers, you become rich. But that, that's bad for social mobility because uh, not only <clears throat> you enhance top income inequality, but you are also being detrimental to social mobility. So if, if instead of innovation here, I was putting lobbying on the horizontal axis, lobbying intensity, I would see that both the continuous curve and the dotted curve would be upward sloping. You see? So it's very interesting because when you are asked about inequality, you should ask which inequality are you talking about? Are you talking about the top income inequality? Or are you talking about global inequality? And also, which source of top income inequality are you talking about? Is it innovation, Steve Jobs, or is it lobbying, Carlos Slim? And it should not be in the same way between these two sources of a top income inequality. You see, that's what I'm different from Piketty. In Piketty's world, uh, there is no innovation. There is no firm. And all ranks are uh, inheritance and lobbying. None of the ranks are innovation. So you have to be very careful when you talk about inequality and uh, uh, innovation or inequality and lobbying. And when you try to understand what is the source of top income inequality. Can you follow what I say? Do you follow me? Yes? Do you follow? Okay. So let's have a pause of one minute before I go to the second part, questioning common wisdom. <clears throat> Okay, 
So now what I want to do is to, speak, to show you that the, the framework, the Superterian growth framework, is also very helpful to question common wisdom about policy. Here, let me, let me limit myself to one uh, common wisdom, which is that we should tax robots to protect employment. You know, there is a view that robotization or automation more generally destroy jobs. And therefore, if you want to protect employment, you should tax robots and you should tax automation. But you know, here it worked uh, with Damien Zaravel, who is uh, also a professor at LSC, and Simon Bunel and Céline Antonin, who are my co authors on the book. And, uh, 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 and that's chapter three of the book. And in chapter three of the book, we look at the, the, the big technological revolution. By the way, a very interesting, uh, uh, I will get back to the previous one. So here, what we show is a, it's an event study, and we show the effect on employment of automating of a firm automating at time zero and you see that it decreases employment already at time zero and even more after 10 years so it's very interesting that firms those are french firms that automate they create employment so you might ah, you might be surprised you might think france how come by automating automating means that you replace manpower by machine how come by doing that you create employment the reason is because firms that automate, they become more competitive, more productive. And as a result, their export price goes down. The quality at the same export price. Either they have a lower price for the same good as they used to do, or they, they, they have a, you know, <coughs> a better quality for the same price that they used to have. But the, the quality at the same export price goes down when they automate. And because their price goes down, they can export more abroad. They, they become more competitive abroad. Their market size abroad increases. So there is a worldwide bigger demand for their products. And because these firms face bigger demand worldwide for their products, they will hire more workers. So you see this productivity effect, in fact, more than compensate for the substitution effect of man by machine. And so if you wanted to tax robots here, it would be very bad because you would penalize, you would punish firms that in fact create employment by automating. You would make more costly for firms to automate, so they would automate less, and therefore they would not be able to reduce their export price. And therefore, you see here I saw the same of firms that automate. You can see that when firms automate, the sales go up. So the story is that when you automate, your export price goes down then you become more competitive worldwide and your pain worldwide go up and because your pain go up, you demand more labor and you employ more people. If I tax those firms, that, that would mitigate that effect. You see, they would, be, they, they would not automate as much, so they would not reduce export price as much, and therefore they would not increase sales as much, and therefore they would not uh, increase employment as much. So that's a bad idea. You see, so uh, and uh, uh, that's, that's the kind of idea. But there is another idea, for example, uh, that we deal with protectionism. Some people believe that the way to, uh, uh, to respond to import shocks, for example, the China shock of the 1990s, the way to respond to it is to do a trade war and to do tariffs. I, uh, and that's a very bad idea because here is Germany and France in COVID products, COVID products is respirator, uh, tests and not, you see that Germany export, which is the triangle uh, uh, black, went up a lot, much more than the German import. But so Germany now has, an ex, uh, uh, has a trade surplus of 20 billion euros on this COVID product, but it achieved that because it innovated and invested, not because it put tariffs from China. If, uh, it would have been a very bad idea to put tariffs from China, because then China would retaliate, and if China retaliates, it would have reduced, it would have uh, the export markets of Germany, and therefore it would have uh, uh, reduced German incentive to innovate. You see what I mean? It's a very bad idea to put tariffs because you, the, the, the destination country, retaliate by closing export markets. If they close export markets, it means that the potential innovator in Germany or France uh, would see a, a smaller market for her innovation, and therefore they would have less incentive to innovate. 
and that would be a bad idea. So the best way to respond to a, a, an investor is to innovate more, not to practice protectionism. And that's what this shows. You see? And so the, the, what we do is a bit to question like that a number of common users. Another one we question is that some people believe that uh, a negative growth is the best response to climate change. But we have a natural experiment there where when you had the lockdown, the first lockdown in France between March and May 2020, uh, GDP in France went down by 35% and uh, CO2 emission uh, only went down by 8%. You see, so uh, uh, that shows that you need more, you need green innovation and you need a whole kind of policies, a uh, whole set of policies to use green innovation, carbon price, uh, uh, subsidy to green innovation, industrial policy, uh, 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 consumer role, fi green finance. And in chapter nine of the book, we detail all the policies that the state can have to redirect technical change towards green technology. And so that's the kind of thing to do in the book. And that's the question in common wisdom. No way, no, don't ask robots to protect employment. Don't use protectionism to respond to infrastructure. Don't use negative growth as a way to deal with climate change. Okay. Now I get to the uh, uh, third part, capitalism. Are you are you hearing me well? Yes. Uh, yes. Okay. Okay. So now we what we want to explain is that uh, uh, the, uh, our paradigm is uh, gives you keys to think about uh, 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 capitalism in the future. The COVID was a revelator. It revealed a broken social model in the US and it revealed an inadequate innovation ecosystem in Europe. Let me just spell this out. This uh, represents the, uh, the curve, this represents the uh, uh, health insurance and unemployment in US and Germany. So the triangle curve, uh, gray, is the evolution of unemployment in the US because of COVID. And it went up a lot because of COVID unemployment. The, the black triangle shows the evolution of unemployment in Germany. The, the, uh, the, the gray uh, circle shows the evolution of the fraction of American citizens without health insurance. And you see that it went up during COVID. Why? Because when you lose your employment in the US, you, are, uh, you have a probability because of that to lose health, proper health insurance. So at the time, like COVID, where the health insurance were more than ever needed in the US, a, a positive fraction of the population lost access to health insurance. You see, and that's why the fraction of uh, individuals in the US without health insurance went up during COVID. Whereas in Germany, it remained uh, zero all the time. So you see, Germany is better than the US to protect individuals against, for example, COVID. Similarly, here is a fair of people uh, going into poverty. Because people, when you lose employment, you become poor in the US, the share of individuals falling into poverty went up with COVID. Uh, in, the US, in, in Germany, it remains constant with COVID. You see, so that shows that uh, uh, Germany is better than US when you have a shock like COVID. But also I could have put UK instead of Germany or the Scandinavian country or France. We do better than US <coughs> to protect the individuals when you have something in the macro stuff like COVID. Okay? That's the bad aspect of the, of the, of the social model in the US. On the other hand, the US are better on innovation. They did Barda, they did Pfizer, Moderna. Okay? Alors, it's true that AstraZeneca was done in the, in the UK, and that's great for the UK. But for example, France, shame on France. France is a country where the notion of vaccine was invented by Pasteur, and France was not able to produce a vaccine. It's the same on us, okay? Here I'm showing you the number of biotech patents per million inhabitants in the US or in EU27 or OECD average. And you see that the US dominates. They have much more biotech patents than we have in Europe. But if I was showing the top cited patterns, which are the highest quality patterns, the discrepancy between US and Europe is even bigger. 
The US completely dominates on biotech patents and particularly on highly cited biotech patents. And why is that? It's because they have a fantastic ecosystem for innovation in the US. For example, the only biotech uh, uh, they have for basic research, they have the National Science Foundation. They have the National Institute of Health. They have the Howard Youth Medical Institute, which say that in chapter 12 of the book. Only for basic research, the Howard Youth Medical Institute is a, 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 is a, is a, a, a institution. It's a, it's, a, it's a sponsor. You see, it's a, it's a sponsor, the donor uh, uh, institution, which is private. So NIS NSF is public, but the Howard Youth is private. You don't have anything equivalent in the US. Then uh, in the US, they have venture capital, very, very well developed. They have institutional investors, very well developed, much more than in Europe. <clears throat> and if they have the BARDA, biology, uh, uh, it's, it's biomedical uh, advanced research and development uh, 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 agency, authority, that's why it's like bio, biomedical. Uh, Advanced Research and Development Authority, that's BARDA. And the BARDA is what finance uh, Moderna, Pfizer, and all that. How does BARDA function? The money comes from the government, but then the government. Sorry, the you, uh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, yes? I was just to say, could we, uh, given the con, we, we are slightly conscious of time, can we just uh, have five more minutes? Or yes, I, I'm done in five minutes. I'm done in five minutes. So uh, uh, the BARDA. It's a, it's a biology, the money comes from the government. Then they give, they, they choose two leaders, and the two leaders elicit competing projects. So Moderna, Pfizer, many labs that you never heard about. And they, 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 they take the risk, they tell people all the risks is on us. So that's how, you know, that's very important to, to turn a basic technology, which was ARN Messenger, in mass vaccine, vaccine production in less than one year. And that we don't have the equivalent of BARDA in, uh, in Europe. Uh, 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 you see, so they have a fantastic ecosystem. And BARDA spent 12 billion, almost 12 billion dollars on COVID uh, vaccine diagnostic therapeutics last year. Europe spent a total of 4 billion dollars, much less. So what I think is that what should we think capitalism, we should combine the good side of the American model, innovation, with a good side of the European model, protection. Some people believe that if you choose to be innovative, you renounce protection. Or if you choose to be protective, you renounce innovation. That's not true. When, the Den when Denmark introduced tech security, which is a system to protect unemployed, you know, when you lose unemployment in Denmark, you, uh, 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 you get 90% of your salary for two years and the state helps you retrain and find a new job. When the Danes, when the Danes invented the flex security system, it made Denmark more innovative and more protective. More educated, you see, and that's what happened in Denmark. When you lose your job, no effect on the probability of being anxious or sleeping pill. No effect on the probability of visiting hospital. No effect on mortality because they have this fantastic flex security system. The other thing is education. We know that the probability of inventing depends very much on parental income. That's the term. The, uh, the horizontal is parental income, the, uh, the vertical is probability of inventing. When you have a uh, high income parents, you're much more likely to invent. Why? Because parents are more high earning parents, are more educated. So you need to invest in education for many generations to flatten that curve. So you have many people which we call lost Einstein, they are very smart, they, they are born, born to poor families who cannot give them the human capital and cannot give them the aspiration. So you need the education system to make up for this uh, lack of support from parents, from parents in these poor families. And if you do that, you will have a more innovative economy because you will have more Einstein and you will have more uh, inclusive economy because those will be more inclusive, you see? And finally, I want to tell you that Competition. I told you before, in the US, you had the growth decline because of lack of competition. Now, suppose you have more competition in the US, it will make, it will spur growth to innovation, there will be more innovation, 
and more inclusion because more entrants will come, more new firms will come to uh, there will be more entry, more creative instruction, and therefore more social mobility. So you see that if you, if you put more competition policy, more adapted competition policy in the US, you make the economy both more innovative and more inclusive. So there is no trade off between innovation and inclusion. You, you can have policies like tech security, like competition, like education, that makes the economy both more innovative and more inclusive. And so I'm done there. I, 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 the, you can have a capitalism that I want is one which is as innovative as the US and as protective as Denmark. And I believe that that can be done. And it can be done very much by the triangle between firm, state, and civil society. That's my last slide. Bold and counting talk a lot about that. Firms are is there, the, what I call Marseille, that's the firm. You need firms to innovate, they innovate. You need the state to regulate the firm, okay, to regulate competition, to do the flex security that I talked about. But you also need civil society. Why? Because in the absence of civil society, uh, uh, incumbent firms can capture the government. They can buy out the, the, the government. And that's why civil society is very important to limit corruption, to denounce collusion between firms, existing firms, and, and, and the political power. And that's why this triangle is key to a successful capitalism. Firm, state, and civil society. And I stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you. OK. Thank How you. long did I do? Was I more than 40 minutes? Did I do more than 40 minutes? No, it was perfect. It was perfect. Thank you so okay. much. OK, very um, good. Thank you so much for the incredible presentation. I think we all really did enjoy it. Um, now I'd like to open it up to any and all questions. Is there anybody who has, has a, like a question that they'd like to ask right now? Please feel free. If not, I do have some questions from the chat. Could so, I could I ask a quick question? Yes. Yes. Um, so in the study, you were mentioning uh, how automation doesn't necessarily trade off with employment. Uh, I was just wondering what kinds of jobs were the automators creating? Were they the similar types of jobs that existed before, or were they sort of roles that were designed to sort of complement the sort of machines they were using to automate their yeah, production? They, uh, it's true that, you know, uh, it, what's very interesting is in our data, we don't see that it's still so skill biased. We find that the composition of employment remains the same. They just hire more and they keep the composition of employment. So we were expecting that it would be more geared towards skill jobs, but we don't find that in our data. So it's a, roughly the same sort of like yeah 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 job. that's okay. what we find. Yeah. What's the right, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Philippe, I'm so sorry, but your audio suddenly went bad. Would it be possible to try without your earphones, please? What do you want me to do? Would it be possible to take off your earphones and try without using earphones? Because the audio suddenly went a bit rough. Like this? You prefer like that? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I think the earphones were better. Actually, the earphones were Yeah, I think we should do the earphones. <laughs> Thank you. Are there any other questions? You spoke about fusing the European social welfare state with American innovation. Do you yeah. think there's implicit tension between, you know, perhaps the bureaucratic structure of the EU and something like the robust um, corporate environment? What applies the United States? Uh, I think you can reconcile them. I, th I think very much. You know, that's what I explained. It's when when the Danes introduced tech security. It made creative destruction much more socially acceptable and much more efficient. So it spurred innovation, and at the same time, it made growth more protective. Uh, education, you have many people who could be innovators. They cannot be innovators because they are, they are not properly educated. And so if you have better education system, you have more innovation and more inclusion. And the competition, the same way, uh, uh, more, more adapted, more suitable competition policy will make the economy both more innovative and more, uh, 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 more inclusive. So I, I don't think that there is a trade-off 
between being innovative and being uh, uh, and being inclusive and productive. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. It's actually been a lot of fun. Um, yeah. Uh, I'm set aside between the European welfare state and the American more like innovative model. How would it make sense for a government uh, fiscally to do such a thing, especially in the short term? So the, the fiscal policy, so you have to be very, very careful on the fiscal. I discussed tax policy chapter five uh, uh, of the book with my co-author. And uh, uh, you know, you have to be very careful. I told you that one can be either from innovation or from lobbying. And or anti barriers. So you have to be very careful because if you over tax, you, uh, uh, you discourage innovation. So, uh, uh, for example, in Sweden, they used to have excessive tax, uh, in particular on capital income, and they reduced their tax on uh, uh, even the high income tax and the, on, on capital income in the early 90s. And that this said innovation in Sweden. So Biden was right to increase taxation there because tax was too low and too unfair. But uh, Sweden was right to uh, modify its tax system the way it did in the early 90s. You have to be very careful because too much taxation destroys innovation. But we know that innovation gives you growth and social mobility. So it may be counterproductive to discourage innovation. So you have to be very careful when you design your tax system. Uh, uh, that's my argument with UKT. UKT always wants to have maximum tax, but it doesn't, it, 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 again, it doesn't. Take into account innovation, and that's important to take that into account. So Biden was right, I think, to raise taxes and also to propose that multinational uh, raise tax, you know, that to impose minimal tax of at least fifteen percent on multinational billionaires. That I was all for, but I think that Sweden was right to reduce a bit the, the tax because the excessive tax rate that it used to have pre nineteen ninety, and so that that's why you have to make smart taxes. And also, to what extent do you think it's the reversal of what Margaret Thatcher said then, when she said there is no such thing as society? Sorry, what, what Margaret Thatcher? What, what do you, to what extent is that related to a reversal of what Margaret Thatcher said when she said there is no such thing as society? No, I think she's wrong. Uh, I don't like the way she did. I mean, Thatcher, it's true there was a problem, you know, there with the, the, the you know, with unions being too powerful, incumbents were too powerful. And so she needed to boost entrepreneurship. So she might, there might have been good things she did, but she operated the patient without anesthetic. She was too brutal. In, the, in, the, in Denmark, you see, they, they pushed entrepreneurship in a way which is uh, uh, socially acceptable. You see what I mean? So I believe very much in the triangle between firms, uh, 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 state, and civil society. This triangle is crucial. And I believe that you can push entrepreneurship in a way which uh, uh, involves civil society and can be and and, and it's for social uh, uh, and 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 and, and it's for uh, mobility and inclusivity. So that's where I differ from Madame Madam, Mrs. Thatcher. I think she did some reforms that were needed to liberalize the market. You needed to liberalize the system, but she did it in a way that ignored the society. Okay. And the problem with that. The problem with that is that it gave you break this. I think break this is a remote consequence of it. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Do you does anybody else have any other questions? <laughs> Hello. Uh, thank you so much for the talk. Uh, a very quick question on the process of creative destruction and impact on innovation, especially as it pertains to different countries. Do you think it's a difference in the way that this process works in developed countries versus frontier markets? So, for example, the US versus Sub Saharan Africa, as well as, for example, middle, middle income countries like South Africa and Brazil, who are stuck in the middle income trap? Yeah. So, you like right to raise the issue of the middle income trap. The middle income trap is chapter seven. Of the, of, the, of, of the book is very much based on work I did with Darren at Chicago and Fabrizio Zilibotti because he said there, there are various ways to grow. You can grow by imitating more advanced uh, countries or you can grow by innovating at the frontier. You innovate upon yourself essentially. 
Okay, and when you are in the process, the institution uh, and policies that are good for uh, helping cat, 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 what I call uh, catching up growth are not the same institutions and policies that foster frontier growth. And uh, uh, the minimum income subsidy, though, is the fact that some countries, when they, they work in the catching up mode, like Korea or even Japan, they had some institutions. And then during that phase, big firms develop, big, big conglomerates. In, 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 in Korea, they are called Chobol. In, in Japan, they are called Keresu. And those big conglomerates not only people new innovation and new entry, but they prevented the government to move towards policies that would be good for frontier innovation. You see what I mean? They got stuck in policies that would be good for catching up, but not necessarily very good for frontier innovation, like competition. We know, and that we saw that in chapter four of the, uh, in chapter, sorry, uh, four of the book, that when uh, uh, that competition uh, is very important for frontier innovation, is less important for catching up uh, growth. You see? And, and so when you move to become frontier, because you are converging to more advanced countries, uh, to more advanced per uh, capita uh, GDP levels, uh, uh, you should, at, at some point, move towards more competitive policy, more competition, more labor market flexibility, etc. And uh, uh, the problem is that the conglomerates that, that, that grew during the catching up phase, they, they turn into barriers, not only to new entry, but to necessary change of policies and institutions from policies that are good for catch up growth to institutions and policies that are good for frontier growth. And that's the problem of Korea. And that was the problem of Japan. Japan grew very fast until the uh, uh, late 80s and then stopped growing because uh, uh, Japan, you know, very much discouraged uh, uh, its big conglomerate to capture very much the government. And, and, and that's the same in Korea. And that's the single of, uh, uh, of the middle income class. But uh, sometimes uh, crisis can help. We explain in chapter seven that the financial crisis of the 90s weakened the power of the conglomerates in Korea and they are allowed more growth because then more entry of new companies occur. So uh, to, a, to a bad, they can be a good. Sometimes crisis can weaken the big incumbents, the big elephants, and because they weaken the big elephants, there is more room, more breathing space for new firms to come in. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, thank you so much. I think we will wrap up the Q&A for now. And on behalf of everyone here, we would like to say thank you so much for the time and the effort. We really had an insightful experience and we are so grateful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much for inviting me. It was a and for the quality of the question. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. Have a Bye. lovely day. Thank Bye. you. Bye.